This is chapter 27, section four, uh, and the first portion of the reading was titled New Horizons in Two Hemispheres, relatively brief, um, but basically discussed the United States' new standing on the global stage. Um, so as a result of the splendid little war, we've already talked about the actual things that it got. Uh, Puerto Rico, Guam, control, partial uh, control and influence in Cuba, um, access to the Caribbean to lead, for, uh, to lead the way for a future canal, uh, the Philippines. Um, and so those are things, all things that are measurable that we receive. But we also receive something that's a little bit less measurable, but we've got some um, details that highlight it, uh, and that's increased respect. So the U.S. is now viewed as a world power, and even at this point in 1890, I guess 1900, let's say, um, it is probably the strongest in the world, um, although I don't think the United States or the other countries yet know that. It probably does not take place until World War, until world War I, 15 or 20 years later. Um, but nations who did not have a diplomatic presence in the United States started to have one. Uh, and so you've got them... Uh, setting up headquarters in Washington, D.C., which was previously viewed as kind of just this backwater, oh yeah, that's the capital of the U.S., but they're nothing, that they're not too big of a deal. Uh, U.S. citizens um, became increasingly patriotic, uh, and again, this is 15, 20 years before World War I, um, and if you remember from uh, I guess ninth and probably 10th grade, uh, the four main reasons of World War I were militarism, alliances, imperialism, and then nationalism. That nationalistic feeling plays into this idea and this growth of patriotism. Uh, the military was viewed as a necessity and having a strong one was viewed as something that the United States needed to have. Uh, Cuba was kind of a mess in how we um, executed our military strategy. We had a bunch of people gather down in Tampa Bay. It was a mess getting over to Cuba. Um, it was disorganized. They didn't have the correct uniforms. Uh, the actual fighting was disorganized as well. Um, and so the U.S. viewed this as an opportunity to improve their military uh, and established the uh, first war college. So Sec uh, Secretary of War Eli Root started a war college. Uh, so that would be like the Naval Academy uh, Air Force Academy, all the academies today uh, draw their direct connections back to what Eli Root did in the early 1900s. Um, there was also a sense of unity among the United States. Um, they shared a common enemy uh, with the Spanish. And so, again, 1900, we're talking uh, 35 years after the Civil War, um, there was still tension there. And you could still say, I think there is even some tension that still exists today. Um, but the Spanish-American War marked a um, point of unity where they're fighting a common enemy. And your textbook even talks about uh, the general uh, who was in Cuba and commanding the Cubans, um, Joseph Wheeler, who uh, supposedly at one point shouted out that uh, he was, uh, you know, going to go attack those Yankees uh, and had to correct himself uh, and switch it to Spaniards. Um, and then we've got the acquisition of the Philippines, which increasingly becomes a thorn in the side of uh, the United States. And that's what the next section, on uh, the next several slides are on, um, is what's known as the Filipino insurrection. So um, the section title in your book was Little Brown Brothers in the Philippines. Uh, and so after the Spanish-American War, the Filipinos thought that they would get their freedom and independence from uh, colonial rule just like Cuba did. And obviously uh, the Platt Amendment was put on Cuba, but they were in name free. The Philippines were not, however. So um, they felt betrayed by this, that the United States has simply just replaced Spain as an imperial overlord. Uh, and so they rose up and began fighting against American troops. Um, and this took place as early as February 4th, 1899. So we're just um, days after the Treaty of Paris and just months after the conclusion of the Spanish-American War. So the Filipino insurrection begins in 1899. Uh, a huge figure in the Filipino insurrection was Emilio Aguinaldo. Uh, he was actually um, 
uh, I'm trip blanking on the word, um, excommunicated essentially from uh, the Philippines uh, while the Spanish were in charge, while the United States brought him back to the Philippines during the Spanish-American War to cause problems for uh, the Spanish. Um, well, fast forward a few months and now he's fighting against the Americans and he's not a traitor in any way. What he's fighting for is the exact same thing. He was fighting the Spanish for uh, Filipino independence and now the opponent has just changed, but he's fighting for the same thing. So he's fighting for the fighting against the Americans um, for Filipino independence. And so he was the leader of this insurrection. Um, and I've had, you guys will write a paper called the internal assessment uh, later this year. I've had several papers written about him and he's just a good example of if you find something that piques your interest or find a little bit interesting, just bookmark it in your brain. It's something you might come back to. Not saying that anyone needs to write a paper on him, but uh, that just popped in my head because I, I read a couple of those over the last couple of years. I mean, Aguinaldo is pictured there uh, on the image on the right. Um, so America's response to this uprising was very similar to the response the Spanish had on the Cuban uprising. Um, you have uh, the water cure taking place, um, which should sound somewhat similar to something that was done, uh, interrogation methods used by the United States, um, ironically enough, in Cuba uh, against suspected terrorists. Um, prison camps were set up for the uh, those fighting against the um, American uh, control of the islands, uh, very much like butcher whalers set up in Cuba. Uh, essentially what the United States is doing is attacking people who just want their freedom and independence. So you see a lot of hypocrisy between what the United States, States supposedly fought the Spanish for during the Spanish-American War and then months later what they are doing to the Filipinos. Uh, the United States did gain the upper hand in 1901, uh, in large part because they captured Aguinaldo, so it kind of cut off the head of the revolution, and the revolution withered and died. Um, and so in 1901, uh, order is restored. Uh, Senator William Howard Taft, I'm sorry, not Senator, they sent William Howard Taft to the Philippines um, to be the civil governor. So he was essentially in charge of the island. He was the American representative of the Philippine Islands. Um, and uh, you can see him pictured there on, I think, an ox. Um, and uh, Tafta does eventually become president, and he's somebody who we will talk more about um, during his presidency. But here's kind of your introduction to him. Uh, and despite the fact the Filipinos did not like the Americans in uh, the Philippines, um, they did like Taft. Uh, and so uh, Taft and the Filipinos had a positive relationship. He referred to them now as something that would not be politically correct. We called them his little brown brothers. Um, and again, that was just, it was a ter term of endearment um, that they both enjoyed each other in your textbook, which this is also a little bit weird, talks about uh, Taft dancing with the Filipino women and something that he, I guess, enjoys doing and they enjoyed. Um, so President McKinley is still in charge at this time, and he adopted a policy of what's called a benevolent assimilation towards the Philippines, the U.S. control of the Philippines. And benevolent just kind of means blind, like you're going to do this, and assimilation means adapt to our ways. Um, and so the thought process was we would use kindness to civilize the people um, of the Filipinos and get them to like us. This is more slow than forced assimil assimilation. Um, and so it did have some successes in terms of um, the living environment, the standard of living in the Philippines. So you had improved infrastructure uh, like roads, sanitation, uh, things like that. You had uh, economic improvements in trade, um, primarily sugar industry was booming uh, between the United States and the Philippines. And you had an improved education system, albeit a Western American education system uh, established in the Philippines. And so despite these gains in standard of living and maybe quality uh, of life, the Filipinos ultimately what they still want is to be free and have self-determination, which they do get on July 4th, 1946, following the conclusion of World War II. Um, and that timeline was actually set up well ahead, and we'll actually talk about that um, here in a few weeks with Woodrow Wilson. So that is it with Chapter 27, Section 4.